Welcome to Cover Stories with Chess Life, the U.S. Chess Federation's podcast that goes behind the scenes and more in depth about each month's Chess Life magazine cover story. Make sure to listen to our family of U.S. Chess podcasts, which includes One Move at a Time on the second Tuesday of each month, where Dan Lucas talks to people who are advancing our mission statement, Ladies' Night, which drops on the third Tuesday of each month, hosted by our women's program director, Jennifer Shahadi, and on the fourth Tuesday of each month, Chess Underground, hosted by our assistant director of national events, Pete Cargianis, in which he examines the game's eccentricities, peculiarities, and theoretical novelties. All can be found at the podcast link on Chess Life Online at uschess.org, or you can subscribe via iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Today's guest on Cover Stories with Chess Life is our first returning guest for the uh, for at least my time on the podcast. He is the man with the fancy hat, Grandmaster Elshan Muradiabadi. Elshan is the author of our November cover story on the 2022 U.S. Open, where after a thrilling Armageddon match with Grandmaster Alexei Sorokin, he finished second on tiebreaks. But as the highest placing American flag player, he earned a seat at the 2022 U.S. Championship. Born in Tehran, Iran, Elshan moved to the U.S. in 2012 to attend college at Texas Tech and play on their chess team. He won the 2017 U.S. Chess Grand Prix, the 2016 Washington International, and the Rilton Cup in Stockholm, Sweden in 2020, right before everything shut down. His most recent tournament was the U.S. Championship, where, well, Let's just say things didn't quite go according to plan. It was really bad. You don't need to sugarcoat it. I, I, I'll explain it later on. It was a disastrous tournament, but you don't need to sugarcoat it. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I think not going according to plan is 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 it's a, it's a okay clean way of putting it. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Um, uh, Elshan is uh, a, a very well regarded coach and author. Um, he has worked with American juniors both privately and at international events. In 2020, he published Sherlock's Method, the working tool for the club player, co-written with WGM Sabina Foyser. And at the U.S. Open this year, he was named the 2022 Chess Journalist of the Year by the Chess Journalists of America. Today, we talked to Elshan on the road as he takes a break from his travels to speak with us here at Chess Life. Hello, Elshan. How are you doing? Hi, John. Thanks for having me here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. And so um, I, I guess really today I, I sort of want to talk about the U.S. Open and your story and the championship and, and some of the things that come out of that. Um, but I guess let's just start at the beginning because you um, you, you wrote the the cover story for our November issue uh, about the U.S. Open. And, and you sort of tell the story of how you came to play there and some advice you got about about how to approach things. So – so why did you come all the way to Rancho Mirage, California? I don't mind to contradict myself <laughs> from this story, but the very deriving force be- behind it was that I didn't get to play U.S. Championship in 2020. And after I qualified in 2019 uh, U.S. Open, and uh, I really wanted to have a full experience about uh, U.S. Championship. And I even didn't, this year didn't get because I had COVID two, three weeks before, and it only finished right before the U.S. Championship. So I, it was... That, is, that was the main part of why I couldn't play at the U.S. Championship. Well, another one was that I didn't want to make draws with White and I was trying to be principled, which at this time is usually uh, doesn't work if you are if you are in a bad shape. Um, but that being said, uh, I, I really haven't been in the arena like uh, Truman's... Uh, sorry, not Truman, sorry. Uh, uh, not Roosevelt, sorry, Roosevelt. My bad, Teddy Roosevelt said in his uh, famous you know address in the uh, citizen in a republic in Sorbonne, france in 19 i think oh uh, I, uh, I keep forgetting these things now brain fog after covid uh, uh <laughs> you're, you're not the only one yeah yeah uh, still there you know being in the arena is very you know the feeling is it's thrilling you know feel it's it's there's no i cannot attach it financial value to it, I cannot attach a dollar value to it, I cannot say what comes out of it, but the feeling, it, it is a thrilling feeling of feeling being alive, you know, that you can take part in something that is meaningful to you. I mean, yeah, the championship went disastrous, don't deny that, but 
I still got some good positions and interesting ideas against the best of the world. And uh, and because I can only play in the U.S. Championship via U.S. Open, then it becomes a very important special tournament. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I, I really liked about the way you told the story in the article. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the U.S. Championship now is one of the strongest round robins in the world uh, annually, and and to get to get into it, I mean, you have to have a, a you know a pretty high rating just to qualify by rating, but there are other ways in, um, and and you know one of them is to win the U.S. Junior, but I, I think you're probably out of luck there. Um, but the other way is to win is is to be the highest ranking American at the U.S. Open, and as you said, you, you did this in 2019, but because of COVID, you ended up playing in the online version of that in 2020. Um, and, and it felt to me, being at the Open with you and talking to you a little bit, um, that you you really were a man on a mission. Like you 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 knew what you wanted to do, and and even your choice of schedule, I, I think, sort of played into that. What what did Alexander Shabalov tell you about schedules? Ah, oh, that 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 part. We had that conversation. Uh, long ago, because I started uh, my start, started dwindling, uh, I was close to 2600 rated, and at the time I could play. I wasn't under U.S. flag while I was close to be a U.S. citizen, so I was a I was a permanent I'm, I was a permanent resident of the United States at the time. So, and I knew I'm going to live here, but I don't know why I didn't change my flag at the time. It was a bit of also political issues back in Iran, and you didn't want. I was worried what can happen to my family, and anyways. Uh, so I was. I said, "Yeah, you see, now it's too strong, and I, my rating has gone down. I can never play." And you say, "Well, you, there's U.S. Open always, and you can always have a shot." And this is um, U.S. Championship seventeen when Sabina won, and we had this conversation uh, at uh, uh, it doesn't the Sub Zero Bar. Now it's bought by the by by the club, and the closing ceremony after the players were there and they were hanging out there, and that started there. And then later on, we talked. Further in 20, because I played the US Open 2021 as well, which was in uh, New Jersey. Right. Yep. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and that was uh, the nutshell. That's where the, the idea came from. So, after all these conversations having with him, 17 and then 2021 just came there that Shabo was like, this is, the way, this is the way you go. You have to beat everyone who is loyal than you and get to round six or seven. And then play your best just one game at one game one game at a time and know that uh you can prepare, you can rest and relax and play a just a regular tournament. And he proved right, at least in my case. Yeah, so you, you played in the traditional schedule, um, which mm-hmm. uh for, for a traditionalist like me, I, I think is is one of the beautiful things about the US Open. And unfortunately, I think uh, I don't know how much longer it's gonna be around. Um they're, not for so long as I was there. Yeah, I, I think there's only a few more of the, the full nine-day schedules available. Um, but um, you you did, you did followed Shabalov's, uh, his prescription to a max, uh, to, to, to the maximum. You, you played six games against lower-rated players. Um, not, some of them were, were uh, easier than others. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you came through with six wins out of six. I think you were the only perfect player after six rounds. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. So what is it like feeling that pressure? I mean, you, you know, in the traditional schedule, the, the next highest rated player was, uh, I think it was I am Tim Taylor, who's rated about 2275 US, uh, US chess. So there was a lot of pressure on you to to win out, to win every single game. What is that like, you know, being a grandmaster and having to play down but win every single round? The, the hardest part is that, like, when you go to these open tournaments and weekend tournaments and all of that, you you want to basically win as fast as you can and win the money, right? I mean, like, it's all about you don't really care. You don't win so much rating or anything. And this was even this was, these are unrated games, right? These are not federated even. So you just want to you know be done with it. And, but then after the first couple of rounds, I started thinking, you know what? I actually have to sit there and I don't care about what my opponent's rating is. I'm just sitting there and trying to play for four hours on good chess and grind down my opponents. And it gradually my game's quality and started to improve. I had one bad day in round five, but round three, eh, relatively I made a small mistake round three, but round four was solid. Round uh, six was also solid. And round three also. So it, the first two rounds weren't really the the difference the gap was too wide to, you know, to really right. worry too much about uh what can happen in those games? So 
they only I only had the one bad day around five of them. And and uh, yeah. Yeah, just uh, there is listeners that don't play hippo, I think. Don't play the hippo. From that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um Yeah, so so after six rounds we hit the merge and immediately you're faced with Naroditsky. Um and that game, uh I, I wasn't sure what uh the spectators were expecting. Um, but that game was drawn without too much too much hullabaloo. Um, yeah. what, what happened in, what, what do you remember? What, what do you, what do you remember about that game? What sticks out to you now? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it was very, it was, I could expect that Danya would play that line, which is silent Sullivan. He would like to get a game and he's very creative. He knows where the pieces you belong to and the great sense of, uh, dynamic. So it makes sense that he would try to play somewhat peaceful line i wouldn't say peaceful like keeping the pieces on the board basically not entering the main line which i mainly prepped for the game and i come at the board and i had prepped there of course in, in a3 system the one he played i, I had prepped in that that line as well i just didn't check last minute because usually i always check last minute before i come to the game just say these are the moves i want to make and then i'm sitting there and i can't recall but one thing i realized that if i think too much then he would he would he would call my bluff. He was so I kept on blitzing out my moves. I played a sub a suboptimal line, which I knew is not that great because I analyzed back in 2018 from I saw a game of Christopher you played white pieces against Sergey Azarov. At the time, Christopher wasn't the, the strong up and coming GM he's now. He was like an IM level, um, and that game was very interesting. But I, I later on looked at it and then I realized that white is actually better in that position. Some. I, w- I wouldn't say clearly better. Maybe top teams would know with the, with good supercomputers or with deep analysis that they know now everybody has a computer with a good computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, that white is clearly better. But I knew, like I looked at some correspondence schemes, black holes by a thread and all of that. So, but I blitz out and then I played a line that I knew I'm worse. But I was like up on the clock and then I felt that Dania wasn't so sure. I, I have a clear plan. I see five, that goes to D5. B7, C5, A4, then come back C5, C4. So I knew the plan. And uh, he's the one who actually has to come up with something. And uh, well, he said that in the, the commentary room, when we were checking the game with the Gowery and Sabina, that uh, he didn't check this line. So I think he got uncomfortable. They offered me a draw. You would accept a draw from a worse position, especially when you're half a point ahead, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, no, that made strategic sense, and uh, that set you up for round eight uh, against Madvishin. Is that how you say it? That's my worst tournament game in the tournament. Like, I was very, very nervous because I knew I have a, a bad uh, tie break. So if I, I knew if I, if I want to separate myself from the rest, so I can get a chance to have a ch- have a shot with the draw to qualify, I need to win that game. So. I played the opening of a prep. I again forgot to check remove rook c4 he played, which, uh, yeah, I somehow didn't check the move uh, in my preparations. And uh, but I still, my reaction, I mean, I reacted all right. I got in playable position, but I was so, uh, I lost it. Uh, I lost, uh, the, I don't know how to say it. I became less objective than I have to be. In that kind of yeah, you you lost your objectivity. Yes, I lost right? my objectivity. Yes, I, I mean, I was always objective for the most part, but then at some point in the, in, uh, along the game, and then toward the time control, I blundered away from a, from an equal position, and I saw his win. I was like, "What well, he seven now? Like, oh, this is it, I guess, huh?" And I was like thinking to myself, and then he gave me the chance to, to sacrifice my queen, and I found this, and then I, I said, "I think he has one very difficult way to win the game." But then uh, he didn't find it, and I found this very beautiful move G3 rook B4 idea, which I'm very proud of. And like I could build a fortress, and he offered a draw, and I survived that one. But again, I knew that last round was going to be very difficult. Yeah, I, I think anybody uh, who is listening to this, and if they have access to a chess database, um, or if they they go to a, the Lee Chess uh, to, to the US USChess.org, if you go down to the bottom of the page, uh, we've got a, a link to all of our coverage of the US Open. Take a look at that game, uh, Elshan's Round Eight game. Um, absolutely fascinating fight, and and the way he saved it was was really inspiring. Um, yeah, definitely worth checking out. And then we get to round nine, and and this key game against uh, Ilya Nizhnik, who, uh, you know, I think I think 
you know, it's hard for somebody who's rated 26, 70 fide or, or whatever he's rated to be underrated or, or sort of, um, you know, he, not getting the attention he deserves, but Nizhnik is, is an incredibly strong player. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I know, uh, he's, he's someone in the past who you've had some trouble with. Um, yeah, I, I've never won a game against him. And in general, I'm like, kind of like his client actually. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, he, he's, a uh, he's, he's a pretty tough customer and, and to make matters worse, you had black. Um, and you also knew you had the worst tie breaks out of all the Americans who, who could possibly, uh, qualify for the, for the U S championship. So, yeah. And what didn't happen hour, as I think I put in the story, Rosenthal was losing, so it was it was absolutely clear that I'm not gonna make it make it to tiebreak, make it to the Armageddon if I make a draw. Right. Like it within a half an hour into the game, I knew I'm not making it because Rosenthal was losing. And so you extensively annotate your your round nine game against Nizhnik in the article. Um, very good annotations, as always, educational. I mean, I expect nothing less from the chess journalist of the year, but we'll we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so so. I mean, in a thumbnail, like looking back, what 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 do you what do you remember about the game? What sort of stands out to you now? You know, uh, three months later. Well, I was very nervous. It explains a lot of the. Uh, I, I, at first, I was very calm at the point. Like I, I was very happy that he was trying hard to beat me after he took beat C three. I was feeling very good, but then when I saw Rosenthalis is losing, I became uh, again lost objective. Became very agitated. So I became I started missing a lot of those small. Uh, a lot of those inaccuracies that I put question mark, uh, exclaim mark are that because of nervousness. Like, I mean, he would just make him, I was like, what I was thinking like for 10 minutes, like immediately occurs to me that, wait a second, this is not working what I was thinking. So I had to, but one thing I give myself credit is I was making these comebacks during the game. I, I, was, I had energy and stuff. And that's one thing I was missing the US championship after COVID. I, within an hour and a half, I couldn't play after an hour and a half. Yeah. After that, I was, I was completely drained after an hour and a half. But here I had energy. So I was making these comebacks. You know, I was making these moves and I was still in the game. So then, okay, luck was on my side later on. Yeah. But it was, uh, I was extremely nervous after that, after I was in Dallas, was losing and I could see that uh, uh, Jacobson had advantage. And the game between, uh, I don't know how, I did, how did that game, was it a draw between J- uh, Schenk and uh, Narodiski? It was a crazy game. I don't remember. I, I I think that was almost decisive. I mean, or or supposed to be decisive. But I think at the end of the day, we had draw. But that's very bad of not remembering that actually. Uh, but anyways, this that's in crazy. So I was like, there, there 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 will be two two players. So I cannot. Which at at the end, Jacobson won, and uh, the young man uh, Gabriel uh, Idleman. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he won too. So. My prediction was right. I needed to win. And you did win. Um, and again, you know, uh, readers should definitely check out the annotations. Um, I, I think you get a good sense of the battle of the, of the nervousness and, and also the triumph at the, at the end of it. Um, you know, it was interesting being in the room there and uh, the, the way that the, the Armageddon, uh, the Armageddon playoff worked because you know, for for people who who aren't familiar with with how the U.S. Open works, uh, if there's a tie for first place, there is an Armageddon playoff to determine who gets the trophy, basically. Who 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 comes in first and who gets the hardware? And Elshan uh, was facing off with Grandmaster Alexei Sorokin, uh, who you know who's down at Texas Tech. And the weird thing, and and, and I don't know, maybe you can speak to this better than I can is basically that we were waiting for, for an amateur game way down, like in, you know, in the, in the hundreds on the boards to finish. So we were waiting for all the games to finish. You didn't know when the, when it was going to start. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as soon as that game is over, basically they're like, all right, it's go time. And and now you have to play and you have to make your bid. And um, it, it was kind of a, it was, it was a, it was a bit of a strange situation. Um, yeah. I, I lost focus. Yeah. So, so looking back, I mean, what, what was, what was the experience like for you? Um, I mean, you know, this, you tell in the story, uh, there was a key moment in the game where you, you missed something and Sorokin got the advantage and uh, took the full point to become the, the winner. Yeah. Um, but um, what, what was it like being there in the hot seat, so to speak? Well, I played it 2019 Armageddon and I played it another one the same year again, same kind of Armageddon against the uh, Narodiski. And I played some other Armageddons online as well. 
so it's not I'm not that familiar with you. I mean, I've played maybe this was the tenth Armageddon I played, and I, this was the second time I lost. So eight out of ten, or maybe seven seven out of nine. I don't remember. I think seven out of nine. It's not a bad score actually for Armageddon. No, uh, I, I lost focus. I mean, I just got too too happy with the. And if if it would have happened because I was still in the, in 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 the zone to, to to play, so if if the game would have happened within three hours after the game, I would still would have had the focus. But after at ten, I, and I didn't drink any coffee, so at we played around ten. I was sleepy. I, at some point during the game, I felt completely I'm, I'm falling asleep. Actually, like I lost like thirty seconds just trying to stay awake. So I, I didn't prep myself for it. So I knew it's gonna be late. I, I should have go back to to where I was because I was staying at the same hotel where the tournament hall was so I had to go back get some nap they would have called me right I mean somebody would say I shouldn't be here I don't know. right but they said they would start right away and I was like a little bit anyways I just stayed around people come and congratulate me and you know had all these conversations and excitement and everything around it uh, yeah I, I lost I, I was in the zone when I got to the game and then I was tired so didn't drink coffee didn't so it was bound to lose. Uh, it was bound to happen like that. So I'm not that. It was me not being professional enough. And certainly, all credit to Sorokin, uh, deserving winner. Um, but you know, uh, I, I think you you really achieved your mission in in Rancho Mirage. You 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 got the seat in the in the championship, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But before we get there, I I want to talk to you about uh, something else that happened at the U.S. Open. You were named the Chess Journalist of the Year by the Chess Journalists of America. Um, certainly, a, as your editor, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of you for that. I, I think you did some outstanding work for us. And uh, I, I was pleased as punch to see that you won it. Uh, what, does, what does it mean to be like the, what does that award mean to you in the sort of the pantheon of, 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 of victories you've had? Uh, actually, I have to say, I, haven't been this proud uh i think it is it was equivalent to, to i won the u.s open like qualifier this year it was that important i was so thrilled and happy and i'm not good with celebrations but i was very thrilled and in my mind it was such a big achievement for me first of all i started learning english when i was like when i started studying english when i was 18 mm. so i was very late i had exposure a lot to english language of course before that but only seriously when I was 18 and, uh, and, uh, and I have to also thank you for all the things you've taught me throughout this time and putting up with my, uh, with, with my progress and <laughs> mentoring me, of course. No, I'm not, I mean it. Uh, I should say that. I appreciate uh, that. Yeah. And I'm not saying it just because I'm here, but you know me, I'm people know me that I just don't say things. Right. I mean it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I always say that you look, make me look good, but uh, it it really meant a lot to me because I, because writing was something I always wanted to to do in my life. Uh, if 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 it wasn't for chess, I wanted to be a, a scriptwriter. I like to write uh, movies, for example, stories. So writing is all has always been a thing for me. I'm not very big on presenting or talking, but I really enjoy writing. But I, but it's very hard, especially if you're. First language, you have to think twice. It, there are difficulties. Grammar always doesn't sink in, although you are aware of it later on. So how did I make this mistake? How can I write these things like this? And uh, it meant a lot. And I would like to win it one more time, actually. Uh, we will work on yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would, yeah. What I'm saying is that it meant, meant a lot to me because it's like branching out of uh, your comfort zone being a chess player and chess coach and do something completely different. It's like if you're acquiring new skills and tools and uh, it's like an adult improver achiever achievement. So it, it meant, it meant a lot to me. You, you are, you are one of the the people I know who truly appreciates chess literature. I mean, you, you've written a book with Sabina. Um, you, you've written articles, uh, you know, for, for chess life and chess life online and other outlets. Why is chess literature still important, you know, in, in the age of stockfish and, and, and you know millions of games available on Lee Chess. Why, why, why should people still be reading chess books and chess magazines? Well, because of the connection. Because uh, you can go run stuff, you memorize some lines, and go and play online. But what's what's the connection? I mean, I think we're 
we're taking out human factor there. And we all need a story. We all need where we come from, where, where the thought process comes from, where, where the surprises. Why a player responds to some similar, apparently obvious moves to stuff spends a lot of time. Why why certain certain strategies are, are adapted by top players in certain situations. So I think there is a story into it, and chess literature con- contributes to it. Like I, I, I feel bad that, for example, all these great events nowadays are happening and no follow-up literature are produced over it. Like, for example, the Fisher Random one was thrilling. But I'm just kidding. You see the game, some reports, and that's done. Yeah, no, as, 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 as a you know, working chess journalist, so to speak, um, it, it, you can't keep up with everything. There, there's so many events. There's so much high-level chess that, I mean, I can't, I can't keep up with it. Oh, that's okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me just let right Sabina that I'm in the middle of the com- something. So is it? Yeah. Just a second. I, I'll finish my thought while you are typing. Um, no, no. Sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, it's it's. There are so many things I would love to cover in chess life, um, and we we just don't have the page space or the the manpower to to cover everything and to get analysts, you know, who could do it justice. Like the like this Fisher Random event. Uh, you know, uh, crazy positions, all sorts of new, new ideas. And you're right. I mean, you know, it, it, we're already onto the, we're already onto the chess.com global championship. I mean, we're, and then we're going to be onto the next thing, you know, right after that. And it's it, chess literature should be the sort of sifting mechanism, right. That, that takes, separates the wheat from the chaff and, and, and gets the, the, the key memorable, important ideas um, and, and, and transmits them to the future, but the, who has time? Well, for example, <laughs> nobody spends time that how dramatic last candidates turned out. Everybody's focused on Magnus not playing, but if Hikaru wouldn't have lost his last game to Ding, it would have been Hikaru yep. versus, yep. versus, uh, Nepomniachi. Right. So, and we, we have another American contender and this is Fisher 50 years, uh, Fisher beating, beating Spassky. I mean, this is, this is a whole whole other show that you can think of and whole story of, of chess, you know, the rivalry and all of that. And now it was becoming the mecca of chess and I'm saying it openly and, and I believe in it and I'm sure I'm right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, nobody even paid attention to that. Is, are there books out about, about the, about the candidates? I think, you know, I think there's maybe, uh, Oh God! What's his name? There, there are games, g- books on game analysis, but something like telling stories around it. What, what's no. going on? No, there's, 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 and yeah, I mean the age of the tournament. But I mean tournament books are are largely a thing of the past, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and, and well, that's because a shame. No, nobody spends time on them, and then players come and go and just ev- they see everything like a, another game. But you see, the, 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 these events cause shift in paradigm without us understanding. We see so much going on nowadays around us that we don't realize that. But there are a shift of paradigms continuously happening in chess world because of this continuous story behind it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, just even watching the, the way that the players played certain opening positions and, and, the, and, and the, um, you know, if you compare this candidates to the one before it and the one before that, um, there, there is a narrative there to be told, and and yeah, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's your next article, but yeah, um, some, somebody may have some somebody could have thought that why why Fabiano went crazy to try to catch uh, Epomniachi when he was like uh, sitting on a comfortable plus three, and if he knew that Magnus is not is is when, where he actually announced, so I think he probably didn't take that seriously because he tried to catch Epomniachi. So what if Fabiano would have just sit on his plus three and tried to make seven draws and just could be i mean the whole thing the whole the whole uh the whole dynamic yeah has a lot into it to be said interview anything and it's just people moved on without even looking back yeah no i mean the same thing's true about the olympiad um yeah i'm I'm working on john donaldson's piece about the olympiad right now and uh without knowing the backstory which which donaldson uh provides for the for the for the open team uh and uh begum uh i can never pronounce her name uh, the, Dr. The, yes, she, uh, she does the one for the women's team without knowing their stories and sort of the context that you get, you don't really understand why certain decisions were made at the board. Um, and you know, already, I mean, the, the, the Olympiad feels like it's a distant memory. 
it's yep. it's yeah everything is just maybe we're just getting old Elshan. i don't know i mean maybe these i don't know maybe well i'm getting old you're you're still pretty young uh, <laughs> but uh, i don't know i mean i think there's a value and i think there's a connection there for it's just literature that you understand where certain decisions come from and you can learn from that right but i think people are less interested in the learning part and more interested in, in the entertainment side of it so i think that's why it is the case yeah i i, I think we're going to talk about that when we talk about the neiman affair and in, in a moment okay. um but mm -hmm. um I, I do want to ask i want to ask about the u.s championship and, and you've already spoken about it some um it, it was it was a rough event and uh as you've said uh you were uh you you were down with covid for a couple of weeks before you uh before the event started and you just did not you know even though you were negative right you were you know, you, you were testing uh, so that you could play. But yeah, I was you, testing every day. Yeah, yeah, but your Even energy just September, never came back. No, I'm still having the brain fog and, and a bit of coughing. In fact, September 25th, I drafted an email to to withdraw. Last uh, is that September 25th August? or 24th? No, so I, I don't know. No, 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 August. No, yeah, no, no, it would September. have been September. Yeah. Your championship is October 5th, right? Yeah, I traveled October 3rd. That's when I got. Tested negative when I traveled there. So, 25th, I was still struggling, trying to recover. So, uh, I, I actually considered withdrawing at that time because I had very high fever uh, at the time. But then, uh, but then, it passed. My fever broke on my fever broke on 25th. So it was 24th. My fever broke on 25th. I think a couple of days later, I got tested negative, and then I was I was I was good to go. But when I said I was good to go, uh, based on CDC recommendation, I was good to go, but not not because I was well. Right, and if if you look at the photos, you were wearing a mask for at least the first half of the event. I was wearing a mask. Uh, I was wearing a mask uh, because they said after uh, I wore a mask for for five days, I think, because mm. after that I was over twenty days. Okay. I was over because the day I told me started was day 15. So that was day 20. And this after 20 days, there is no, there is impossible, almost zero chance of you can, can cause any problem. So, yeah. Um, this, this is going to seem maybe a, a strange question, but you know, I, I think every chess player um, can empathize with, with what you went through. I mean, we've all been in events where we're sick or we're not feeling well and results just don't come. No, they cannot empathize because the, the the problem is not the result for me. The problem is that I didn't want to sit at the board. That was a torture for me because I was sitting at the board and in an hour and a half I was gone. I couldn't see anything, and this was a torture. I knew I'm going to the board, and not enjoying being at the board. Yeah, that that yeah. was the thing. I like something I was looking for was so much to be there. And then the joy was not there. Anymore. Yeah, because I was beat at sitting at the board, and that was the thing. It's not about losing ten games. It's about the fact that I was sitting there, but I knew I didn't want to be there. And that was very, so that nobody actually can, I'm not trying to dramatize it, but the thing is not about the vision. No, no, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because, you know, on the one hand, I mean, you know, I, I wanted to ask you how, like how you feel like you recover from this, but it also sounds like, like in a certain sense, there's not anything to recover from. Like you, you, like the the suffering is over because the event's over and now you can look forward to to sitting down at the board sometime in the future and feeling that joy again yes yes because like i was sitting at the board i, I would forget like in, within 20 minutes i would forget my prep yeah like i mean i spent all these hours prepping i, I mean i was telling myself why am i even doing the prep so like for example and and then you know then when you have this uh, all this brain fog then you suddenly have uh, emotions kicking. For example, against when I lost in ten moves against uh, uh, Dominguez that day, my ex coach Grandmaster Constantin Lando passed away. I, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, I, I had prep and 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 I know that he's uh, he's an expert in uh, in, in Petrov. I mean, Linia knows it in and I mean inside out. But I saw this was so tra traumatizing to me. Because the last conversation we had, I looked at Facebook. He just said, "I'm." He wanted to help me with 2020 uh, U.S. Championship. We prepped uh, some Petrov, which actually Sabina played. I didn't end up playing. So 
And then we said, I, I'm sick. I have to go back to, to, to Germany to, I talk to you later. And we never talked ever since. And we shared the same birthday. So I just got emotional, decided two hours before the game to play, to play, uh, that I checked my files, but it doesn't make you a pitch player over, over two hours. So it, it was almost like an homage to your coach. Yeah. Wow. Which was, which is wrong, which is wrong. You see, but if I weren't emotional, I wouldn't have done. It. Yeah. No, no, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. But I mean, yeah, g- given, given the frame of mind and, and given that you'd gotten this news and, and you know, to, to an outsider, it looks like you just, you know, something just went wrong. And, but as you were saying about, you know, tournaments and the candidates and, and, you know, the, the value of literature, you know, there's always a context there that you don't know about just by looking at the moves in chess space. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can't tell. Yeah. I mean, people go and put the games there without, so people cannot sympathize and people, and I received a lot of, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but this was really saddening. Like, even your friend don't understand what happened, this and that, receiving all of these texts, which was like, you really have to give the guy breaks, really. And that was really heartbreaking for me to see that people writing me what happened or stuff. I received a lot of good uh, support, which I really appreciate from the chess community. But for, from some people, it was really heartbreaking, you know, without knowing the background story, you see, that's just the part. And, you know, they just, you know, Write about it or post about it and everything. Not that I care as much, but at that moment, it, that moment it hurts. Now I see it and I don't care. I don't care what people post online. But the thing is, that moment it hurts because you're going through something which is beyond just the result of what happened. And, uh, and you see all of this, so like, without people without, no, I, so this is what it is. I mean, I, I'm, at, I'm at peace with it, of course. But, uh, yeah. This is, uh, yeah, the, the, the joys of living in, in, in the internet age with Twitter and, yeah. Facebook and yeah, but yeah, but ag- so but goes. again, I, in a normal day, I'm a rational day. I would have never played Petrov. Petrov wasn't even part of my prep for the U.S. Championship. Let's l- let's talk about sort of one of the the other elements of this U.S. Championship, um, and you know, it's it sort of, I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. the Hans Neiman affair, the 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 allegations. Uh, that that Magnus Carlsen raised, and then the rest of the chess world basically spent weeks toying with and playing with. Um, they they certainly cast a, a, a pallor over the U.S. Championship this year. Um, you know the some of the the top players, you know, uh, Caruana and So, and some of the others have all spoken publicly at various points about what they thought about Neiman and the and the charges. What was it like to be in the room while all of this is sort of going on in the chess world? I mean, did it did it make it a, a strange sort of situation? No, I didn't care. I had I had I was worried that my parents are alive with things happening in Iran, so I couldn't talk with them for days. So really, it didn't. Hans Zimmer was the last thing in my mind the whole time. Yeah, you know, I didn't I didn't want to bring it up unless you brought it up. But I mean, this is I think this is also something that people aren't really aware of that. You know, you're trying to play in this U.S. championship, and 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 you're physically not well, and at the same time, there is a revolution going on in Iran where yeah. your parents are. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So honestly, it didn't matter to me what was going on. I didn't check anything, all the Twitters or anything. I didn't watch any of the commentaries. Not that they're all doing a fantastic job. I'm not saying that. Just I was like, that was I, that I wasn't to, what you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? I mean was was it strange to play him knowing that the 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 scrutiny would be there? Uh, my game was very strange, but uh, I, I I cannot deny that it, it gets to you, it gets to you as you are playing sometimes. Yeah, but uh, for the most part, I wasn't thinking about it. This wasn't in my head. But you know, at at times, the thing is that it is against the players too. It's not only against him, because I'm sitting yeah. there. And when he makes a good move, it suddenly can trigger you. I was like, no, I mean, it's a normal move. Any, any grandmaster can make this move. But what am I making a big deal in my head out of it? So you see, it just, so it, it can affect you in that sense too. So, I mean, I don't know. Some, some others may not be affected, but it was affecting me. So I was like, no, but it's a normal move he made. I mean, so I, I managed to beat it through the game, but, uh, at, at, at times it was getting to me, especially being that sick and emotional. It was even worse. But uh, no, for the most part of the game, I was just playing my game. I was, I was who I was. Let, let, let's talk about the sort of broader ramifications of of the Neiman affair. I guess, I guess that's what I'm going to call it now. Um, 
cheating is clearly a big concern for some for some of the world's top players. Mm-hmm. Does that is that something you've worried about in you know in in modern chess? I mean, cheating online or, or cheating in person? Uh, cheating in person, specifically, for example, in our open tournaments, we almost have no measure. So I mean, St. Louis, it was good. It was pretty good. I, I'm sure there are rooms for improvement. I don't want to put ex- expense or something on the club, but I'm. This was the best but possible that could be done, given that I mean there should be live co- uh, live coverage and everything. Um, I think one thing. Okay, this nobody would like me saying that, but I think if they want to be absolutely clear about everything, if they jam the place, then they, they don't. If from signals, then they have no worries about it, like complete like the world championship. But I don't know if it's possible because they have to have the live commentary. So I don't know if this right. But what I'm saying is that they did absolutely everything they could do, and I'm really everything was at the highest possible level and. Uh, uh, people, everybody were cooperative of that. But I'm going to an open tournament. I mean, they don't even check for for cell phones. Yeah. People come, people go. Anyone can walk into the tournament. Anyone can walk out. And uh, nowadays, you can lose to anybody that can sell. I've been working hard on that just during COVID. Everybody into, to, uh, you lose to 21. I mean, I'm not saying me or as a grandma. So anybody can come win something and say, I've been working hard during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and the burnout province. Yeah, so it is scary. I mean, you go to tournaments; it's scary. It's 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 hard to. I, I struggle with it too. I mean, you know, uh, I'm certainly not playing for. <laughs> I mean, you know, look, I'm I'm a, I'm a class player. I'm you know, I'm, I'm playing local tournaments, and I, I never really think that anyone I'm playing is 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 going to do that. But at the same time, it's hard not to be a little bit paranoid. You know, when you when you see kids running out of the room and talking to their parents or running to the bathroom a whole lot, you know, I mean, you begin to wonder, like, you know, are they are they getting help? Are they talking to their friends? What's going on? This is the bad part because exactly, exactly. Because I wasn't thinking about it in the past. Yeah. I was always yeah. thinking, oh, I mean, some people may maybe once in a while, but not. But now with this happening, the same I said when I was playing, it was it was kicking in from time to time in my head. Now it can kick in against anyone else. It's not only about Hans anymore. And uh, I think this was this is the part again that the social media and the media in general didn't handle it so well in the chess world. This was bad because you see everybody's gonna pay for it. It's not only Hans. Yeah, it's not only the chess world. It's everybody's gonna pay. Everybody's in it now. Now this paranoia. Everybody's gonna it's gonna hunt everyone. Do uh, it's not only me. It's not only you. It's not only players who are playing Hans. It's not the scrutiny on Hans from, from now. It's gonna be the whole. Package is this? Is this one of the reasons that you don't play so much online? I mean, so for example, like in the database, there are grandmasters who play, you know, both title Tuesdays every week. Uh, I don't play title Tuesday because I don't have a chance to win any, uh, anything in it, and uh, I don't like the time control. Okay, well, why don't you like the time control? Uh, I think it's three plus two is it's either should be like three forty five zero, like no increment. Okay, but it takes cheating completely out of it. Or three and a half. Flagging because if anyone is cheating, they can be easily caught. The, the system will catch them immediately. And uh, one second doesn't do much. It should be two seconds because you, you still can get flagged too if you have, few, you have few seconds. One second is not enough to, because if you are winning, you can play fast, you can get a few seconds toward the end. So if you want to save the person from flagging, one second is not enough. So I don't like the time control. That's why I don't play it. Okay. What is next for you? So, you know, you, you've played the championship, you are. Uh, you're teaching, obviously. Uh, yes, that's my main job, basically. And I, I suspect you will be back in St. Louis at some point, either for an event or to be a grandmaster in residence at the club. I mean, it's a yearly thing. So all this year has been over, so it's going to be 2023. Well, the first thing I have in hand, I am working on something for you. I mean, I don't know if I should keep this as a surprise, but we've been discussing it for a while. So I'm working on that. Mm-hmm. It's a very nice content. I don't know if depends on what you call it, but I'm working on that content. It's very exciting to me. And uh, the other thing is I'm excited, excited about is that the K-12 coming up in Maryland, and I'll be the GM race there. That is right. So, yeah, so the K-12, the K-12 grade championships uh, coming up at the beginning of December. And, yeah, so you'll be on site to play Blitz and give simuls. Hey, lectures and stuff. Yeah, so anyone who's interested in meeting you could come to the K-12s, and that would be uh, that'd be a nice way to get to know you a little bit if, if you happen to be in the area or if you want to make the pilgrimage. Uh, <laughs> you can come and see Elshan. Yeah. Um, and so then, and, yes, go ahead, go ahead. And the other thing, sorry, uh, the other thing is that, you know, we had this past May, we did some work of, uh, 
community service with uh, with Chess for Refugees a little bit. Yes, and uh, we've had this conversation with uh, with Carol Myers, CEO of the U.S. Chess Federation, and uh, with all these things happening in my life, I didn't have a chance to get back at this. But uh, with a little bit of time at hand, maybe I can get back and come up with something that this can be not be done in one single thing, but it's something that USCF and people who care for such causes can can contribute more frequently and more in a more well established way in a well established way not just uh, yeah outstanding yeah, this, yeah i think um these are the three things i am working on and then a trip to new zealand coming up for me so finally i can see the world down under i will play two tournaments there in new zealand yeah all right in january are you, are you gonna watch all the uh <clears throat> the lord of the rings movies just to get ready uh no i think to get ready i said we'll, we'll trust my chest better than the movies but uh <laughs> But uh, I'll go to Queenstown. I'll I'll spend a few days there to see the the site, I'll, the cruise, and all of that. Outstanding. All right. Well, Elshan, um, before you go, and you've done this once already, so you sort of know what's coming. But mm-hmm. uh, at the end of every podcast, I like to ask my subjects to answer some questions mm-hmm. uh, based on, well, originally based on a questionnaire by Marcel Proust uh, mm-hmm. that was was uh, adapted by Bernard Pivot and made famous by James Lipton on Inside the Actors Studio. So uh, if anyone is curious, you can go back to Elshan's first appearance and check his answers and see uh, see how they match up. But Elshan Maradi Abadi, I'm going to ask you 10 questions. Just top of your head, spitballing, free association. Mm-hmm. First thing that comes to mind. All right. Elshan, what is your favorite word? That one is easy. That's ethos. Ethos. Yes, All ethos. Right. Yes, that, I think that's the same answer. That's it's from the Big Lebowski. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I've never met anyone who is committed to dudism as you are. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm trying to practice. It's hard, you know, with all the things going life throwing curveball at you. But uh, I'm trying to. Yes, it keeps me sane. I yeah. Th- there are much. I can tell you, m- much worse life philosophies I think out there than 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 that. So. Yeah. Uh, what is your least favorite word? Least favorite word. This might might have changed over. T- um, okay, it, it will be controversial. So I'm going to say my second least favorite word. Okay. Yeah, uh, ism. Anything ends with an ism. I'm, okay, we call it dudism, but any, I'm a little bit too much against you know constructed you know uh, or organized uh, beliefs. I had, that's, that's, I, I had a, I had a professor who, um, Tom Alexander, if for some reason noted Dewey scholar and, uh, Dewey and aesthetic scholar, uh, Tom Alexander is listening to this. Tom always warned us about isms, uh, when he was thinking of uh, philosophical schools of thought, but I think more generally, yeah. A- any sort of clinging to any sort of notion as, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a life buoy can be dangerous. So, Yeah. Uh, okay, let's put this place. I, I can use one one here. Conformism. I don't like that. Ah, conformism. I like that. That's yes. Yeah. Uh, Elshan, what is your dream of happiness? Uh, I think uh, I was just actually at the, at the French place. Uh, Mr. David Grimond, you know him, is a head of association of the South Carolina Chess Association. We'll have a tour here in South Carolina and. They have a view to a lake, and it's a beautiful view uh, from their house. And I was saying that this is, I like to sit and looking at such a view. I like, I love lakes. I love to have a view to a lake and uh, uh, have my coffee or whatever drink I fancy to have, maybe maybe some alcoholic or non alcoholic beverage. Um, listen to Simon and Garfunkel and create content. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. Uh, towards what faults do you feel most indulgent? Traveling, I would just call it a fault. It's just my, I don't know, fault. Okay, it's can you maybe elaborate on fault? So yeah, like a character flaw, or or ah. indulgent toward a character flaw. Probably gluten. <laughs> yes, I, I, all of us these days. I, I definitely agree. Yeah. Um, whose face would you like to see on a new banknote? Uh, 
That's I don't know what I answered last time. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Elshan, what opening do you love? I don't have a favorite one. I cannot say. What yeah. one do you hate? Actually, Scandinavian. Oh, shots fired, John Bartholomew. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, other than uh, other than in? yeah, other than what you're doing, yeah. Um, in reality, I I really like statistics. So I want to do something. I wish I had a degree in statistics and experienced a little bit working in data. But what I really wanted for myself was acting. Really? Yeah. I could see that. You're an expressive guy. I could see that. Um, what what profession would you not like to attempt? Mm, politics, if it's a profession, because it doesn't sound like a profession to me, but politics. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of us feeling that way these days. Yeah. Last question, El Shamaradi Abadi. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, you abide well, son. Abide indeed. Elshan, uh, if people want to find you, if they're, if they're interested in lessons or uh, if they have something they want to reach out, uh, what, what's the best uh, way to find you? Uh, my email, elshan.maradiabadi at gmail.com or uh, Twitter uh, are the best places to find me. And, uh, and, uh, it's coming up. I am setting up some, some new website, some, something I'm working on in terms of content. Uh, but that's not going to be in near future, but uh, for the time being, my email and my Twitter are the best places to reach out and text me. Um, people find me sometimes on Instagram, too, but it's kind of a hit and miss. Mm -hmm. And LinkedIn too. So the people have found, found me in these places too, which is surprising. I usually don't, it's odd that I just happened to open, but I mean, I maybe a few days later or something, but uh, the Twitter and the uh, Gmail are kind of, they can be sure that I, they reach me in, in a timely fashion. All right. Elshan, well, thank you very much for your time. I, uh, I hope your trip uh, is, is going to be fruitful and you'll have a lot of fun in, in South Carolina. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you talking to us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this edition of Cover Stories with Chess Life. Our podcast will return next month on the first Tuesday when we will again be making a deep dive into the pages of Chess Life magazine. U.S. Chess is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose educational mission is to empower people, enrich lives, and enhance communities through chess. To become a member, go to uschess.org and click on the Join button where you can find a membership option that is right for you. As a member, you enjoy rated play, print and digital copies of Chess Life or Chess Life Kids, and you help U.S. Chess grow the game. If you're already a member, consider clicking on the donate button at uschess.org. Our podcasts are produced and edited by Jason Andre at Seven Season Films Photography and Media. Please visit sevenseasonfilms.com to find out how to start your own podcast. Thank you and good chess. Chess Life.